Call to worship Psalms 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Spirit and teaching them to obey everything. 
everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end.
that song before, uh, Build Your Kingdom Here. We are the fire. God gives us the fire to set this nation back, right? To bring us. We are the light. Amen. We have to let God shine through us. And we don't have, and God is so much stronger than the darkness. The darkness fears when we are with God, Amen. right? Amen. Amen. We need to believe that in our hearts, and sometimes we get so clouded, and we forget that our God is so much stronger. And sometimes we need to open our eyes, and God has so much more for us to see. Don't get clouded by the darkness. This next song, Jesus paid it all. He paid it all for every single one of us, no matter what we did, our lives, nobody's perfect. We've all made mistakes. We've all made poor choices in our lives. But God paid it for us because he loves you. Sometimes it's hard to grasp that because we're like, me? <laughs> Why would he love me? I could be so much better, but God doesn't care. Amen. He loves you. Remember that. The altar is open for this song. Lay down whatever's on your heart and give glory to God.
You are so much more than that. You paid it all because you love us just the way we are. And you want only good for us, Lord. God, forgive us for forgiving that. Open our eyes today, God. Give us the strength to set this nation back. Let your light shine through us. Because God, we got we gotta make a decision. We gotta change it. We have to make a difference. Every day is a new day to share your love and share your your goodness that, that we have because of what you did for us. You changed our lives. You changed our hearts. Give us strength to go forth and try to change this Modesto, change the Central Valley. God, because we need it. God, whatever's laying on the hearts of the people at the altar or in the congregation, Lord, I just pray that you lay your hand over them and give them peace. Whatever's heavy on their hearts, let them fill your presence, God. Let them hear your words. God, if it's somebody that they're praying for, God, I pray that you, you bless their lives. God, I thank you again so much for all that you do. Let us hear your words today, Lord. Not take it in vain and go take it with us when we leave here. Take it with us when we go throughout this week. God, we thank you again for all that you do in your name. Amen. Thank you so much, worship team, for leading us in worshiping God. It's, it's a, you're such a blessing. Kids, you can come on up. Uh, Lily and Jack are here, special treat to help us with the kids' message. Maybe you don't really need to do 
all that stuff. Does that make sense? That's time management. It's actually managing your life. Okay, kids? You can talk to your parents about that. If you get way, way too busy sometimes, you can make a list of the things that you need to do and do what's important first. Can you remember that? Okay. All right. Maybe we can work on that. I'll get a calendar and we'll work on it. Okay, Jack? Thank you. I Oh, good. Kids, you can go to Kids Church now. Thanks for listening. along with my message, and who knows, I, I was thinking about that today, I was thinking, well, why can't a kid learn about time management? They get busy too, don't they, with all the stuff they have to do with school and everything? How many of you feel that you find yourself short on time? Raise your hand. Now, how many of you feel like you have enough time? There are some of you that do feel like you have enough time, okay? You and people that don't, that have enough time, you need to help the people that don't have time, okay? <laughs> How many of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about? <laughs> Me? Oh. Okay, Here, here's a scenario for you to make you feel good. You've got three years to change the world forever. How are you going to manage your time? Three years, and it's a little task. You just need to change the whole world forever. How are you going to manage your time? Now, who am I talking about? Yeah, and actually, I couldn't find a, 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 a picture on the net that said three years changed the world. I found one that said three days changed the world, referring to the three days that Jesus was on the cross. Right, it could be said that he changed the world in three days. Yes? Adjust your mic. I think oh, Jack knocked it. My mic? No, Jack knocked your mic away somewhere oh, there. My, my mic was not on. Ah, there you go. Oh, thank you. All right, that's, that's much better, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, thanks Thanks for telling me. His name is Mike, by the way. Oh, Mike. <laughs> and the other guy's name is Computer. <laughs> okay, now, am I okay? All right, you're supposed to tell me when I do something wrong. Oh, it's John. Okay, yeah, it's John. <laughs> okay, now, if, G Jesus, if, if Jesus were to think like a time management person, like a leadership guru, you got three years to change the world, okay? What is his strategy going to be? Okay, it would have to first be to overthrow Herod, because that guy was one wicked leader. He'd first have to throw, overthrow Herod, and then when he got enough troops, he could overthrow the Romans. And of course, he has the two huge, huge advantages, doesn't he? If one of his soldiers gets killed, he just heals him. <laughs> and who worries about supply lines? Just take one loaf and a couple pieces of bread and just multiply it. I mean, with those two advantages alone, Jesus could have taken over the whole world, right? Yeah. That would be man's way of doing it, wouldn't it? In fact, I'm going to read the scripture later. There was a time when the people said, yeah, let's make him king. He just got done feeding us. After he fed the 5,000, they go, let's make him king. Free food. And you don't even have to have food stamps. <laughs> yeah. Although the, the menu is a little limited, bread and fish. I wouldn't do too well on that. I'd rather have steak or whatever. Well, that's the world's way of doing it, and that's the, the, the CEO's way of doing it. And, you know, there is some really good stuff on time management, and I've taken, actually, a time management uh, uh, class. The Rotary that I was with had a top time management expert come in and do a, a, a one-day seminar, and I took it. I learned a lot. And one of the people that's the best in leadership belt, who's a Christian, is John Maxwell. In his book, Developing Leader Within You, he talks about setting priorities, which is basically time management. And I'm going to read a little bit. 
because there's some really good stuff in there, but I'm not going to give you all that much on, on how time management from a, a corporate perspective, but I want to give you a little bit. He says in here, people used to talk a lot about time management, but the reality is you can't manage time. Managing something means controlling it, changing it, and when it comes to time, there's nothing to manage. Everybody gets 24 hours in a day. We can't add another hour or subtract one. We can't slow it down or speed it up. Time is what it is. Coach and speaker Jamie Cornell wrote, time cannot and will not be managed and you will never get more of it. The problem is rooted in the choices you're making with others, with others and your own choices. You choose how to use every moment of every day whether you believe you do or not. So there's some really, really good stuff if you want to learn about some practical tips about time management from leadership. Basically, if you go to a seminar, you're going to learn what I just taught the kids was have a calendar, uh, set your priorities, and do your priorities. Now, that's written kind of from a person who's a leader perspective, and most of the people that teach time management are leaders. But I was thinking about this yesterday. We went to a, a ME3 uh, conference, which is a training conference that the denomination, the conference put on in San Jose, and I was writing over there and back with uh, Jose German and with uh, Patton. And uh, Jose and I were talking, and Pat and I were talking, and uh, especially I was talking with Jose about the jobs that he's had recently. And he had one job where he was working for a bakery, and they had, and they had uh, a schedule of things that he had done that he, could, that he had to do that he could not humanly in any way get done. And then he had another job where every 53 seconds he had to install a part in a car. It was an assembly line in a car. And so everything's mechanized and you have to really, really, really work hard to get everything done. And he couldn't possibly, these jobs were impossible. He couldn't get them done. And other people that took over the job found out they couldn't get it done either. And I thought, yeah, you know, time management is really good when, the t when your time is your own and you can manage it. But sometimes you're in situations where the, you don't have time that's your own. Someone else owns your time. So what do you do? You do the best you can. You work your, your tail off. And, and now, and you know what I was thinking about that? Um, you know this. You have to work really, really hard to make a living, even here in this wonderful land of America, don't you? You're not getting stuff for free. You have to work hard. I was thinking about you too, Ephraim. You know, when you're at the, the pizza place, you're working hard, you know? And um, so you have some time outside of work, and sometimes you can use time management principles to make your work better. If you're a boss or you're, you're self-employed, you have a little bit more discretion. If you're not, you may not. But you have time outside of work that is just as important as the time that you spend in work, maybe in some cases even more important. So let's say you have a short amount of time. How do you manage that time? And let's say that you feel like you don't have any time. You're running around like a chicken with its head cut off. And they don't run around with their heads cut off. They flop on the ground. But, you know, what do you do? The more limited your time, the better you have to manage your time. I remember in college, I was taking 18 hours. I was in the choir and traveling every weekend with the share team. And I was also running cross country and running track. And I had all these things that I was doing. And I had a little black book that I kept to write down my priorities and things that I had to do. And if I didn't have that black book, I would have been sunk because I could not remember all the stuff I had to do. So the more cramped you are for time, the more you have to manage. Now, if you have more time, you have a lot of free time, then don't worry too much about managing it. Think more in terms of, well, maybe I should sit down and plan and, do, and, and add some things or do some things that I think have an impact on the kingdom. But I'm going to give you, and all that time management stuff is really good, and you might need to learn some of that, but I'm going to take a whole different approach mostly today in my message. Okay? I'm going to give you a whole different way of looking at your time. 
The problem with boxes and, the, and having a set way of looking at some, something is sometimes those boxes don't work. They blow up. And I don't want you just to think outside the box right now. I'd like for you to be able to try to imagine what it would be like from God's perspective a being for whom time makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. You ever think about that? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I love science fiction. I love physics. I love philosophy. We live in time and space. We live there. God doesn't. You can't even wrap your mind around that. And so sometimes when he breaks into time, we have some events that are timeless in Scripture. There are two words for time in the Bible, two Greek words. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I like to pretend that I am, just like the other pastors all do. There are two words, chronos and kairos. Chronos is chronological, it's the ticking of the clock, it's measuring time. Kairos can best be described as timing, an event that has a significant impact. We typically say, oh, I've got the limited amount of chronos, time, and I've got to get this stuff done. But then things happen in our lives in, a, in just a moment that have life-lasting impact on us. Like the time that you decide to open your heart up and give your life to God. That's an eternal thing. It's beyond time. And the words in these scriptures, although they don't use these words, they have the concept in them. Uh, the chronos, the ticking of time. Psalm 90, 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Modern day language, paraphrasing that. What that means is... Remember that your days are limited. You only have so many days and years on this earth, and then you're going to be in heaven. So don't take up your days for granted. Try to get wisdom. Try to use your, your time wisely. So that would say, okay, take the time management seminar, right? But here's another one, Ephesians 5, 16. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. There are opportunities, there are moments in time where significant things can happen for God and His kingdom and in your life. And you're running around, you're, you're running like a chicken with your head cut off, trying to get everything done, and here's an opportunity. God's trying to break in, and He can't break in because you're so busy, so focused on all the stuff you've got to get done that God can't get a, a word in edgewise and maybe you miss an opportunity. We all do. We all do. Yesterday I was uh, at the doctor's office. I was having my annual checkup and they asked me to get some blood. Or it wasn't yesterday. How time flies. <laughs> when was it? It was this week sometime. <laughs> Oh yeah, yesterday I was at, at uh, ME3. It was Tuesday. And I'm there and I just got done getting blood and I, there's a young man that comes to our church some, on his, a lot of times on a skateboard. His name is DeMont. And I look over and I see DeMont. And, I, and of course we're, we both had to fast for 12 hours to get our blood drawn. I said, DeMont, how are you doing? And he was honest with me. He says, I'm not doing very well. I said, why not? He says, I haven't eaten anything, and I'm hungry. <laughs> I said, well, me too. I said, really nice to see you, and I went on my way. And then I drove home, and when I got home, I thought, why didn't I ask him to go out to eat with me after he got his blood drawn? I had the time. I could have done it on Tuesday. I just didn't think about it. I thought DeMont might be here today, but he's not here. But... I'm going to go out to, I'll have to make an appointment now to go out, and it would have been so easy for me just to say, hey, DeMont, are you hungry? I'll take you out to breakfast. Maybe that was God's divine opportunity, and I missed it. 
Now, sometimes I've, had, I've seen God's divine opportunities and I've taken advantage of them. So how can we live in our way, in, in our lives, and get everything done, but yet not close ourselves out to when God wants to break in and do the miraculous or do something in an instant? I think um, God is, uh, we need to, to rethink how we look at time. You know, God is outside of time, but he works within time. The ancient Greek philosophers were right about this because modern physicists have confirmed it, that time is movement. That may not make sense to you, but it is true. Time is movement. Um, you can know that by the speed, by relativity. You probably heard that if you go to the speed of light, that time slows down to almost nothing. So an astronaut, astronaut if he's going the speed of light around the Earth, circling around the Earth, time would not pass for them, and 100 years could be, they could be up there a, a moment and come back down here, and it could be 100 years could be gone. That's uh, time is move is actually movement. So here's the thing. How fast is God? He can, his, his speed cannot be, me cannot be measured. It's faster than thought. So how does time matter to God at all? It, it, it's, 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 it's insignificant. Only in that we live in time and he breaks into our time and he helps us from time to time. <laughs> Time doesn't matter to God. Galatians 4, 4 says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Timing is what matters to God, not time. But also, because God is outside of time, it's kind of frustrating to us. God is abnormally patient. I'm in pain! I'll heal you in a moment. Right now, that's not working into my big plan, okay? You're going to have to suffer for a little while. People are going to have to see you suffer and say, wow, look how that person's suffering for the Lord, how God is helping that person through suffering. Because I've got this big plan here. So time, God is outside of time, and he's abnormally patient, but sometimes he does something in the blink of, the, of an eye that would take us years to do. So don't underestimate what God can do in the heart of a person. Amen. The change that he can do. You've been praying for someone for 30 years and you've never seen anything and then all of a sudden, kaboom! God changes them. Overnight. Delivers them. I'm supposed to point to the saying on the screen. Okay, there is trust in God's timing. It's better to wait a while and have things fall into place than to rush and have things fall apart. Sometimes we have to be reminded of that. We're rushing, rushing, rushing. We don't have enough time. Lord, help me. Take it easy. Take your time. Trust in me. I want to show some unusual scriptures. You might not look at these as time management, but I had an insight this week when I was thinking about it. These are scriptures that give us an insight into God and time. They're re it's really different. John 7, 1 through 8. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one wants to become a public figure and acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. He said, okay, if they go, if you're such so great, you're healing all these people, go to the big city, Jerusalem, and show them, and then you can be the big shot in Jerusalem where all the leaders are. Therefore, Jesus told them, my time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I'm not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he said this, he stayed in Galilee. So he stays a little while in Galilee, and then just a little while later, he goes to the festival. So for Jesus, just a little bit of difference in time was not in God's plan for him. 
God has a, an incredible sense of timing. Even a little bit of difference in time sometimes makes a difference. God has a plan for your life. Don't mess it up. Are you following that plan? Are you following his plan for you? Are you open to changing your plan if God speaks to you and says, that's not what I want you to do, that's not where I want you to go? Are you open to that? God does care about you. He loves you. John chapter 6. Here's another place where, where we see God's timing is so important. Jesus feeds the 5,000. There might have been 15,000 people there. He divided them into groups and they fed them with the loaves and the fishes. Remember that story? After Verse 14. After the people uh, saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So, politically, the crowds are saying, this is your time. You can now overthrow Herod. You can now uh, be the coming king. You can be the Messiah, the new leader of Jerusalem. And the crowds were going to make him king by force. This is your time. And Jesus withdraws to a mountain to pray. And I've asked myself, why did he do that? I understand why he didn't let him make him king by force, because his, his mission was the cross, and they didn't understand that, right? But why do you think he withdrew at that point to the mountain and spent all night in prayer? Why do you think? I have my ideas. Maybe you have a different idea. Anybody want to offer a... I mean, this is a real question. Anybody want to offer an idea, a cup, an idea or two? Huh? What about if he was tempted? You know, that's what I thought. I, I thought he, he may have been tempted. That was the easy way out, wasn't it? Any other ideas? That's the only thought I could think of. Yeah. Because they thought that Jesus was the king rather than God. Oh, yeah. There's an idea. Uh huh. Yeah. There might have been more than one reason, right? It wasn't this time. Yeah. He needed direction too. Yeah, he needed direction. Yeah. Sometimes when things are going really, 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 really good, you need to get away and pray. Lord, this is going too good. What's going on? This looks really, really good. This job. Solve all of my problems. This, this person that I'm dating looks really, really good. This looks like the one. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> you guys have wanted, you've all been to marriage, marriage class. But. Right. Sometimes we need to just kind of step back and we need to pray and find God's will in our life, even when it looks really, really good. Proverbs 16, 9 says, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. There's nothing wrong with making plans. God made us to organize and make plans. That was part of the way, that's part of the image of God in us, the ability to make plans and do things. But it says the Lord determines our steps. When we're making our plans, make good plans, but keep your spirit tuned to God and be open when he changes your plans. Coincidences may be God at work. You make the plans, but God determines the steps. It's not just about doing right, but doing it at the right time. <clears throat> now in John chapter 5, another, another scripture I want to share. Jesus heals a lame man on the Sabbath, and he tells him to pick up his mat and walk. The Pharisees see the man carrying his mat, and they're upset about this because he worked on the Sabbath. And he's, they're upset at the man because he was carrying his mat, and they're upset at Jesus. They were upset at times at Jesus because he healed on the Sabbath, which they considered work. Doesn't that just blow your mind? Sorry, Memorial Hospital, you're going to close down on Sundays. <laughs> yeah. 
Isn't that crazy? It says in verse 16, So the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. But Jesus replied, My father is always working, and so am I. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him, for he not only broke the Sabbath, he called God his father, therefore making himself equal with God. I'm always working, and my father is working. Have you ever felt like you're always working? How many of you have felt that way? Come on, Paul, raise your hand. I know you feel that way. Ever since you took over that company, you feel like you're always working, right? Yeah, yeah, you feel that way sometimes. You have to do that to make a, a living. Well, Jesus says God's always working. God, did, God created the world. He rested on the seventh day as an example to us. But plants don't stop growing on, on, on Sundays or Saturdays, depending on if you're a Jew or a Christian. Plants don't stop growing, do they? God is always working. He says, I'm always working. So it doesn't matter if it's the Sabbath. I'm going to heal on the Sabbath. And here's the thing. God likes moving objects. Everything in the universe is moving. Right now, because you are warm, if you're absolute zero, maybe there wouldn't be movement. But right now, every molecule in your body is moving like crazy. Right now, the world is moving. Right now, the solar system is moving. Even the universe is expanding and moving. God loves movement. Work is of God. He likes people of action. But there are times when God says, be still and listen. Psalm 23, he leads me beside still waters. Do you know when to speak and when to listen? Sometimes I don't. Do you know when to, when to move and when to be still? That's God's timing. That's the ultimate time management, the way God does it. We structure our lives and we like structure and habits. We live by rules because it makes life easier. You don't have to make so many decisions when you have habits. It's, it's a practical necessity. You don't have to get up and decide every morning, well, now, where did I put my socks? Every day I put them in, a, every time I have laundry, I put them in a different place. You know, structure is really helpful, isn't it? We structure our lives and we need structure. And time management will teach you how to structure your life better and more in order to have more time for other things that you might enjoy more. So that's part of our life, the chronos, the ticking of the clock, the structure, that's time management. But Jesus did not allow structure and rules to get in the way of how God worked through him. He didn't care that the rules said you couldn't do this on the Sabbath. He saw an opportunity to show compassion and he, and he did it. He didn't allow the bot, them to box him in. And here's the thing. It's good for us to have structure. It's good for us to have rules. But we also have to stay open to how God might be breaking into our life. Did you know that sometimes, in, in, in fact most times, if you are facing a problem that you can't get through, that you can't get over, it's a really difficult problem. It could be at work. It could be in a relationship. It could be at home. It could be even here at church. You're facing a very difficult problem. One of the reasons why God allows us to struggle so much with our problems is because he wants us to change our thinking, our way of acting and thinking. And when you get a really difficult problem, you have to think outside the box. You have to think creatively to solve that problem. And that's one of the reasons why God allows us to struggle with things. It's when we come across things that are very difficult and we have to think creative, creatively that the breakthroughs come, personal breakthroughs. You're struggling with a personal problem, depression, say, or anxiety. Why do you struggle so much with that? God wants you to take a look at that in a completely different way. He wants to redeem it and help it in your life. Whatever you're struggling with, there's an answer in the Lord, but he might want you to change the way you think about that thing. That's a principle of time management, too. It's a, it's a major principle, and I learned that was one of the things I learned at that seminar that surprised me. 
And lastly, I have one more thing. I could say a lot of things about time management in the Bible, but there's one very basic one that I don't want to skip over, and that's to invest in others in order, in order to multiply your time. That's called making disciples. And it's a good practice whether you're talking about the church or whether you're talking about your business. It takes more time to train and invest in other people, but it has the potential of multiplying your time. That was Jesus' main strategy. So be looking for untapped potential in others, in your family, your neighbors, church people, people at work. Be looking for people that you can invest in and multiply your time and your creative ability. Jesus' whole life was part of God's master plan. The reason he wouldn't go down to Jerusalem was because it was not yet time for him to die on the cross. Like about a year later, he went down there. It was God's time. The biggest question for Jesus was always, what does God want me to do right now, and how does that fit into his big plan? That question needs to be on our hearts and minds. A life touched, lived in touch with the Holy Spirit is a life well spent. It's a life lived in wisdom. It's a life filled with purpose. It's a life of peace. It's a life that stewards our time, which all belongs to God. So stay in touch with God. Let him break into your life. Take the time management seminar. Learn all you can. Get all the wisdom you can. But keep your ear to the sky because God wants to do something in a blink of an eye that you couldn't do in a million years. Praise God. Don't lose faith. Worship team's going to come up in a moment, but we're going to give of our tithes and our offering right now. And you're welcome to put the uh, next step card in the offering or give it to an usher today. We'll ask the Lord's blessing on our offering. that's in touch with you. May your spirit speak to each person here. Bless this money that it might multiply for your kingdom purposes. Bless our time and our energies that it might be used for you. In the name of Jesus, amen.
And he's given you an opportunity to have a lasting, eternal impact for him. Don't miss it this week. God's going to give you an opportunity. If you're able to go as scriptural, God's going to give you an opportunity to do in his time and do something wonderful for him. Don't miss out on the opportunity. And I want to say a blessing over you. God bless each person here and live through their life. Give them energy and time and help them to know what your will is so that they can focus their life and bring glory to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah.